There is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. The Remember that? Barack Obama talking about unity. Feels like a long, long time ago. Polls show polarization is strong on most issues. You can see a list of them. Congress, more divided than the voters. Razor thin majorities in the House and Senate. President Biden, though, has gotten several bipartisan wins that you see here. And so it raises a question. Is there still the prospect of bipartisanship? Is this division one-sided? And why do we keep hearing that it's rising? Take a listen. The negotiations were basically blown up after Donald Trump said on True Social, we are better off not making a deal. Speaker Johnson said he conferred with Donald Trump, who does not want the bill to be passed because Donald Trump doesn't want President Biden to get any credit. The speaker said no because Donald Trump said no. The speaker is Donald Trump's no boy. And let me show a little more. Here's more of that division that we hear about. Let's play the, do we have that montage? I'm going to play what was one thing for you guys, and then we're bringing the guests. Take a look. My fear is that those, those gaps, those divides, those tension, that will all only grow. The polarization in politics now is second worst ever. We're just fighting over national issues, just screaming into the wind. So are we on the brink of another civil war? Our two parties are just extraordinarily far apart. We hear it a lot. Let's get into it. Che is back with us, along with the Harvard Negotiation Program co-founder, William Urey, author of Possible, How We Survive and Thrive in the Age of Conflict. Uh, William, tell us your thoughts. You've thought a lot about this, and we're hearing it is the worst ever, but also Biden folks say they can get certain things done, at least with some Republicans. Ari, actually, I feel like actually our country needs more conflict, not less, but healthy conflict the kind that allows us to grow and evolve as a democracy, confront injustices. And the truth is we can't end the conflict. We can't end the polarization, but we can transform it from destructive fights in which everyone ends up losing into constructive negotiation. That's our choice. And do you think right now it is getting worse or it's overstated? It's getting worse. There's no question about it. And what we forget is there's an exhausted majority in this country who still tell pollsters that they believe that we Americans share more than what divides us and that healthy conflict is actually possible. That's our hope. And William, when we hear Harvard negotiation expert, we say, oh, okay, sounds, sounds good. Uh, what is something you would impart uh, to the people in Washington or the people at home uh, about constructive negotiation? Well, one thing I would say is I've spent about 45 years wandering around the world, working in some of the world's toughest conflicts. And people always ask me, are you an optimist or a pessimist? And I say, I'm a possibilist. Why? Because I've seen with my own eyes in like South Africa, how blacks and whites put an end to apartheid. I saw in Northern Ireland, how Catholics and Protestants put an end to sectarian strife. In Colombia, where guerrillas and government, you know, 50 years of war. So I've seen the impo seemingly impossible become possible. And I think if they could do it, so can we here in this country. It sounds good. I don't want to be a downer. Uh, but, Che, uh, I'm curious your hard headed sort of real politic response to that, because you you've pointed out that there is an age gap. And what's concerning is that the younger Republicans who've came of age or been elected since 16 um, are, are actually the most hardcore. And so to think of this as only about the current potential front running nominee, um, the former president, um, might actually be too limited that we might be in for it, Jay. Yeah, I mean, you talk about being a possibilist. Joe Biden, I think, is very much a possibilist. Politics is the art of the possible, as Bismarck said, and Joe Biden practices it and practices it very well. I mean, he's gotten a lot of bipartisan deals done. Uh, he could have gotten even more if it wasn't for Donald Trump, who does the exact opposite. He practices the, the politics of conflict. And if you think about it, you know, Aristotle said that there were basically two types of politics. There's the politics of improvement, and then there's the politics of reward and punishment. Joe Biden practices the politics of improvement. He tries to unite the country in common purpose for improvement. That's the way uh, presidential politics, effective presidential politics, historically has been conducted. Donald Trump is all about the politics of rewards and punishments. 
He rewards himself first and foremost and his family financially, and he rewards his followers by owning the libs, antics, insults, punishing those who oppose him. So those are the two paths before us, and that's the choice we have this November. And then, Che, I'm gonna ask you, and then William, you can weigh in as well. Sometimes this rhetoric, the discourse, can get very both sidesy. Um, che, if you say to me, does only one party have a problem with politicians uh, who face evidence of crime? I would say no. I I've seen and covered those stories in both parties. Uh, yeah. Senator Menendez is a top Democrat who's facing his second uh, criminal trial, and the evidence on the corruption is strong. Presumed innocent, mm -hmm. just like Trump. But if you ask me, uh, do both parties share equal blame for this so-called polarization? Um, the evidence shows no, um, that Obama and Biden spent a lot of time trying to reach a compromise. The border bill, we just showed some some sound on that, was a compromise that then Republicans scuttled when they got what what they asked for. Yeah, I mean, the reality is it's Trump who is the difference. Donald Trump practices a politics where the goal is to humiliate and subjugate those who oppose him. Uh, and Joe Biden practices a very different type of politics. He's about uniting people in a common purpose towards certain ends. Now, Ronald Reagan practiced that exact same type of politics. The difference was I opposed the purpose and the ends that Ronald Reagan proposed, but that was what he did. He tried to unite people to get to that purpose. And so Donald Trump, who practices this very conflict-oriented politics and his followers who like it, that is the central problem in our politics. And it's something that we need to really get past. We need to get past Donald Trump specifically. Reagan also liked jelly beans. Yes, uh, I love jelly beans. Jelly beans are delicious. Just saying. Especially root beer flavor, yes. Uh, so, William, that's the sort of the pressure point. You're obviously skilled, and anyone watching this sees your optimism. Um, but what do you say to that one-sided aspect of this, at least on the recent history, or even just the border example? Well, I don't want to underestimate how difficult it is. This is the hardest work that we humans can do, is to transform these really difficult, impossible conflicts. All I can say is I've been in situations where you're dealing with people like, uh, you know, like, you know, who are, you know, bullying and, and dominating and using power and and using violence even in these situations. And I've seen those situations turn around. It's hard. It's hard work. Uh, you and and it's true that the way through is basically instead of going to the gutter, we got to find a way to go to the balcony, which is a place of perspective. And that's what allowed those bills to be paid, that you, those bills to be delivered, you know, working with Joe Manchin. I mean, people had given up on that deal. People had utterly given up on that deal, but Biden and Schumer stuck with it. They practiced good negotiation, relationship, cultivating empathy, trying to write Manchin's victory speech. What is he going to tell the voters in West Virginia? And they were able to make the seemingly impossible possible. I think that's what we need in this country. Yeah. Uh, che and William, uh, on the big picture perspective, thank you both. Uh, up next, I want to give you an important update on a case that is about espionage, if you ask the U.S. government, but also about free speech, if you ask a lot of other people.